Flowers on graves, funerary practices since the Neanderthals. Yes, the world needs another podcast. Hello everybody and welcome to the very first episode of 23 Minutes Archaeology with me, Noah. Since this is our first time together, let me quickly give you a layout of the whole thing. My aim is to show and highlight amazing archaeological finds from our past from around the world and in a way that is accessible to everybody. So, we'll be discussing themes like mummies from glaciers, Siberian graves with treasures of gold or the diet of Celtic warriors. The idea is that for around 15 minutes I'll give you an introduction and overview of the topic and then for the remaining time we will talk with an expert currently researching the specific topic. As archaeology is quite a visual discipline, this podcast also has an Instagram page. So, for better understanding, I will upload a few pictures each episode of whatever we're discussing. So, while listening, you can actually go and see mass graves from the Stone Age or tattoos on mummies and so on. My aim is for this to be fun and informative for everybody, but still with the premise of being scientifically accurate. That's why you'll find references of the articles and books I used in the description of each episode. At last, quickly to myself, as I said, my name is Noah, I'm from Switzerland and I studied prehistoric archaeology. Currently, I'm working on my PhD thesis. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's start with episode 1. Considering our upcoming episodes, I thought it would be good to first give a general introduction concerning the limitations of archaeological research, especially in the reconstruction of burial rites. I chose an example to illustrate how we work and try to find clues on prehistoric funerary practices. We will look at over 50,000 year old intentional burials of Neanderthal individuals found in Shanidar Cave and talk with Dr. Emma Pomeroy from the University of Cambridge who published the amazing new results from her excavations of this northern Iraqi site. Mortuary behavior is one of the many traits that were previously widely considered to be uniquely human. It can be broadly defined as any activity that involves the dead body of a conspecific and may include various types of ritualized or symbolic components. Examples of mortuary behavior have been documented for a variety of species, from the carrying of dead infants by chimpanzee or gorilla mothers for weeks at a time, or the revisit of elephant carcasses by members of their social group. What most of these burial practices have in common is that they occur in species with a relatively high level of social cognition with long-term bonds between group members. So, while some researchers have debated whether Neanderthals practiced certain mortuary or burial behaviors, very few have argued that they lacked the capacity of such. Thus, there is no reason to expect no burial activity among Neanderthals, we just need to find them. But how do we do it? In general, archaeological research tries to reconstruct human actions based on findings in the ground. The repeated observation of the same archaeological findings allows to characterize a practice. This practice itself can correspond to a rite if combined with ritual ideas, which in turn are very likely in the context of burials of human remains. A wide variety of cults and rituals can be expected for the funerary habits in prehistoric times. So, with the data from the analysis of human remains and objects, we try to find clues of these burial rites. But it's important to keep in mind that the spiritual world, the belief system and quote-unquote religion, etc., remains hidden for the most part. Archaeology is only able to grasp the materialization of such rites, which we then try to interpret, for example by analogies from ethnological accounts. 
The aspect of the quote-unquote sacred in an object or action is often not recognizable as such. Only objects that deviate strongly from the norm are often assigned in the area of cults or rituals. It can be assumed that many more objects had a symbolic or religious meaning than we can recognize today. In other words, the beliefs of the prehistoric people remain hidden from us for the most part. In addition, the burial which we excavate corresponds probably only to one aspect of a longer and more complex funerary process, from the determination of death to the actual burial. It is likely that many stages of this process leave no archaeological traces at all, for example, the preparation and decoration of the corpse or honors and lamentations, and may have been more important in the burial ritual than the actual burial itself. It is also important to keep in mind that with discovered graves we also only have a section of the whole prehistoric population. Many more graves may have not been found yet, were destroyed or the people were buried in a manner which leaves almost no traces. Archaeology can therefore only get a very incomplete picture of the past. It is consequently difficult to interpret and even recognize certain burial practices on the basis of archaeological evidence and to understand the attitudes of prehistoric people towards death without relying too much on pure speculation, which I generally try to avoid. One of the challenges encountered in the discussion of mortuary behavior in Paleolithic times is terminology, since the label as quote-unquote grave can evoke the image of a deep linear ditch, which is not the case with respect to Neanderthal burials. In the Paleolithic period, excavation tools were very rudimentary, so burial pits were probably not very deep or regular. It is likely that available natural sites, such as caves, were favored by Neanderthals to dispose of their dead. Bodies may have also been deliberately covered with soil, for example to deter scavengers. With all these restrictions and limitations in mind, let's now look at a specific example. In this episode we will discuss the Neanderthal burials in Shanidar cave, famous for quote-unquote presumed deliberate deposition of flowers on burial number 4. I will not go too much into detail into this very interesting site here, but I think it serves as a good example of how archaeological research works. Shanidar Cave is located in northern Iraq and was excavated between 1953 and 1960. Initially, the remains of nine Neanderthals were found, indicating that the Neanderthals repeatedly returned to the same spot to bury their dead. Neanderthals probably also used the cave for shelter and as a temporary resting place, indicated by traces of fireplaces containing animal bones and burned plant remains. It was suggested that some of the discovered individuals may have been killed by rocks falling from the cave roof, while others had been buried with former burial rites. The latter mainly includes Shanidar IV, the so-called flower burial, because clumps of flower pollen were found in two soil samples surrounding the human remains of burial IV. They were interpreted as evidence for the intentional placement of flowers with the buried individual. And of course, it's fascinating and evokes a lot of images to think of grieving Neanderthals placing flowers on graves of loved ones, just like we do, but over 50,000 years ago. However, this so-called flower burial remains controversial. Some have argued that wind could have brought the pollen into the cave. 
Jeffrey Summer suggested in an article in 1999 that a small rodent, Meriones persicus, could have also been capable to bring enough flower heads into the cave to account for the pollen found near Burial 4, because during the excavation it was obvious that the cave floor was full of rodent burrows and it's not clear if they were avoided during soil sampling. These rodents store large amounts of seeds and other vegetable material, reportedly entire flower heads, in their burrows. And many bones of these rodents were found in the cave and they could be responsible for the flower pollen found under grave 4. A new research program led by Professor Graham Barker from the University of Cambridge between 2015 and 2020 revealed several new Neanderthal bones in the Shanidar cave. These in situ Neanderthal remains provide strong evidence for the deliberate burial of individuals. In situ is another term I will probably repeatedly use in this podcast. It's what archaeologists call finds that are still more or less in their original place and haven't been moved. In 2017, they found the upper body of an individual named Shanidar Z. The surrounding layer contained charcoal, lithics and animal bone splinters. One piece of flint with use wear signs was found near the back of the individual. Maybe it can be regarded as a grave good. The individual itself was almost in sleeping position, laid on the back with the head resting on top of the left hand. A stone was placed behind the head. The articulated nature and completedness of the remains indicate a deliberate placement and burial of the body. Otherwise it would have been exposed and accessible to scavengers. The preliminary results of the recent dating program indicate that Neanderthals repeatedly placed bodies in the Shanidar cave over a period of at least 20,000 years, from around 70,000 to about 50,000 years ago. Over this long period of time, it is very unlikely that there was a consistent quote-unquote burial tradition. It's also important to note that Neanderthals shouldn't be considered as a single entity. Over a period of some 300,000 years, their range expanded from Spain to Siberia. They showed different regional, cultural and technological developments, for example, in the type of stone tools they used. It is therefore extremely unlikely that their burial behavior was uniform. So, with the example from the Neanderthals, I hope I was able to give you some basic aspects of how archaeologists try to find out more about prehistoric funerary habits and how difficult it is to actually find clear evidence for certain rituals without relying too much on speculation. And with that, I am very happy to present to you my conversation with Dr. Emma Pomeroy about her research project. Um, Emma, first, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to talk with me. And maybe as a starter, in, in my opinion, one of the interesting aspects about our profession is to be able to do field research and go on excavations in remote and distant places. As Shanidar Cave is located in northern Iraq, what were your experiences working there? Maybe also in regards to cooperation with local authorities. I'm asking, uh, since your research project went on during the last five years, the time we were all disturbed by the activities of ISIS. I'm thinking of the destruction of Palmyra in, in Syria, for example, in, in 2015. So what were your experiences in, in that regard? Yeah, no, I mean... I would agree. It's one of the real privileges of our field is that we can sometimes get to go and work abroad, but sometimes these very challenging places to work too. Um, 
The project itself at Shenandoah Cave was actually set up initially um, at the invitation of the um, General Director of Antiquities in Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, they approached Professor Graham Barker at the University of Cambridge. So from the very beginning, there was quite a close you know, working relationship with the local authorities. So not only with the General Director of Antiquities, but also um, the local office at Soran. Um, which is the one that covers the particular area of Shandar Cave. And yes, I think they pr first um, approached Graham in 2011. And then excavations first were start starting in, I think, um, around 2014. And that's before I joined the project, because um, I'm a paleoanthropologist and osteoarchaeologist. And the intention was actually never to really find any more Neanderthal remains. Um, and so I joined once they did. But in that first field season, um, unfortunately, they did have to evacuate because um, ISIS were threatening uh, the airport at Erbil, which is um, where we travel into and is relatively close to the site. Um, since that, though, touch wood, we've been fairly lucky in terms of being able to carry on with field work. Um, you know, undisturbed. Uh, there's very good um, security in that region. So, um, it feels, you know, there's, there's road checks and things like that. So, so we feel pretty secure and it's actually really wonderful because there's, I think it's hard to imagine what life is like in other parts of the world where they are really troubled by some of these sort of political um, situations that we don't experience firsthand. And so it's really reassuring working at the cave that actually on, the, on a Friday, which is sort of the day off there, we get loads of um, local visitors. There's lots of people coming and having picnics at the site and, you know, coming to see it. It's a very important cultural site, but it also speaks to the fact that there is a great deal of normal life. And that's, you know, that's a good thing to, to see going on. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's very nice to hear. Uh, I I touched upon to to get to the to the specific site. I I touched upon the debate about the so-called flower burial burial number four. Where do you land on this? Is the pollen from a rodent? Did did wind blow it into the cave, or was it placed there intentionally by quote unquote grieving Neanderthals? That's a really good question, and I think it's still unresolved. I mean, I think before I joined the Shenandoah Cave project, I was pretty sceptical that it was a genuine, you know, flower burial, as Ralph Selecki had put it across, and that probably it was either contamination or, um, you know, you mentioned rodents or wind blowing it in, or even the workmen kind of bring it in all on their clothes, that kind of thing. Um, I think certainly with the more recent findings we've had with Shanadar Z, um, which is the new Neanderthal remains that we found um, more recently that are, are directly associated with that Shanadar 4 cluster, we have direct evidence for preservation of, um, of plant materials at least. And we don't see a great deal of evidence in that particular area for rodent burrows, although there are insect burrows, so that might be another explanation but certainly there's pr preservation of ancient plant materials which would suggest that you know they're not necessarily modern contamination it's also very interesting um we've been working uh, with ralph selecki's archive at um the S smithsonian institution in the states and there's some very interesting correspondence there from um arlette leroy goran who was the palynologist who did that original work um with ralph selecki who was the original excavator yeah. and she makes some really interesting points about how some of these explanations are unlikely um, things like rodents she said the kind of flowers actually they would struggle to get hold of them because they're on big long stems so it seems very unlikely that they would then climb up these stems and, and pick the flowers and drag them down into burrows and things like that um, and there's various reasons she outlines that those explanations don't really work so I th that for me is also quite convincing. Um, and I think that's one of the exciting things with our, our recent findings. That we've kind of got another opportunity to actually sort of look at whether there's pollen um, and other plant remains in that particular area. I think it's also telling that there were the clusters of pollen. And, and as um, our let Leroy Goran um, describes in the original publication, you know, there, there were clusters of pollen and they did actually sample elsewhere in the cave, perhaps not as systematically as we would do today, but the pattern around Channel Dar 5 was different. 
the matter of interpretation is a, a tricky one because then is it sort of grieving Neanderthals, putting flowers there in a way that we would really recognise in kind of recent Western culture? Or is it something else? And, and we're considering other potential explanations. For example, it could be that um, the body was covered with some of these plants rather than it being sort of covered with soil, for example. And that might be an explanation. There are some of the plants as well are um, not the ones that you might necessarily lie or think to lie, kind of a, a close relative or someone you feel, um, you know, a lot of compassion for on top of because they're kind of spiky and not yeah. necessarily, you know, the sort of things that you might um, associate with, with putting with the body. So I think we have to ent entertain other explanations and perhaps you know, this is like a, a covering or something like that, potentially. So so more work to do. But I, I certainly think now that the flower burial is, is a is a possibility. And it is great to have this opportunity to sort of reinvestigate some of the some of the different theories that are out there and, and perhaps rethink the evidence. Yeah, of course. And it just evokes also a lot of images <laughs> thinking about this this practice. Yeah, and absolutely. The, the human remains of at least four uh, individuals were found clustered together. And maybe it's important to state that it's quite a big cave, at least as far as I understood, um, that was probably repeatedly visited over a very long time frame of up to, to 20,000 years. Why do you think were they, they clustered? Do the remains represent a collective burial or was the spot marked or, or special in some way? That's a great question. And again, we're, we're still sort of thinking through the different explanations for this, because you're absolutely right. I mean, those four individuals, and um, one of which was the flower burial, Shanadar 4, were found within sort of a metre by a metre by half a metre block of sediment. So they're really tightly together there. And the new remains that we found, um, Shandar Z, are probably part of that same four individuals. So it is very tight and, and it is a big cave. So you then do question, well, why four individuals in such a small space? Um, it could be that they died at the same time. And unfortunately that evidence was lost with that original sort of block of sediment they took out with Shandar 4 and the other individuals of the cluster because they then had to transport that block. You know, this was 1960. They had to transport it then down to Baghdad. It was excavated um, in the museum there. But by the time it got there, the remains had become rather jumbled. So they couldn't see the relationships mm -hmm. and see whether these individuals were likely to have been there at the same time or whether there's actually sediment between them things like that um one of the things that we have with the new remains so we do have the, the shandar z remains but beneath that there are some sporadic other remains that are separated by a good layer of sediment um a good you know a good few centimeters and that suggests to me at the moment although there's more work to do that perhaps they are, there is a gap in time and they are coming back to this one same spot. Why they're doing that and how they're doing that is obviously another big question. And it would seem so next to where the flower barrel was removed and where Shandar Z is, we have this sort of vertical block of stone that has fallen from um, a big fault line in the roof of the cave. Yeah. And that was there before the bodies were there. So that would suggest that this could have acted as some kind of a marker for that one particular spot. So I think although we're, we're still looking at this, there is some evidence of returning to that same spot on different occasions from the, the new evidence we have. I think possibly we're never going to be able to answer that definitively for the Shanadar 4 cluster, because, like I said, that evidence was just not preserved in that case. Um, but I think we can say, yes, they were coming back to the same spot, place, placing remains in that same spot. And there is the possibility of the marker there. And then we need to sort of think quite carefully about how we might interpret that in terms of being a special place or a, a convenient place, you know, and investigate the evidence potentially for other markers. We did find an um, unusually placed stone with um, Shanadar Z sort of mm -hmm. behind the head, which again yes. might suggest another marker. But we also have to entertain more kind of straightforward explanations as well. Um, so, so yeah, I, I guess the important thing is not to jump to conclusions and actually evaluate and let the evidence speak um, 
for itself. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'm not an expert in, in the geographic region or, or the subject, but during the time frame of the Neanderthals visiting the cave and its surroundings, do you also have traces of, of other Homo sapiens? Uh, were they present at the time or location? Yeah, so that's actually one of the questions we're trying to um, sort of unravel a bit further in the Shandar Cave project at the moment. So we knew from, um, for example, at Shandar Cave from Selecki's excavations there, that there was a, uh, that the modern humans did follow the Neanderthals there. Um, and Selecki suggested there was, you know, a substantial gap of uh, perhaps thousands of years. And the, the initial kind of upper Paleolithic in the region is called the Baradostian. And we do get these Baradostian tools um, in, in the layers above uh, the Mousterian and Neanderthal remains below. We don't have any modern human remains until much later. Um, so those sort of, mm -hmm. it, it's hard to, you know, although we've got the Neanderthal remains, we don't have very early sort of paleolithic modern human remains. One of the things that we're observing as we sort of revisit the areas that Selecki excavated was actually that there wasn't such a big gap and that there may have been potentially some overlap or certainly a, a close following of modern humans to Neanderthals in the cave. But it's something that's quite complex to unravel, like a, a lot of caves, the, the geology yeah, and yeah. the sediments and, you know, cave stratigraphy is notoriously tricky to interpret. So that's yes. something we're still working on. But another technique we're trying as well is, um, as they've tried other sites, um, environmental DNA, so extracting DNA from the sediments, it's tricky somewhere like Shanadar because you've got a very warm environment so it's not great for the preservation of DNA mm -hmm. uh, and you know up until now we still don't have Neanderthal DNA or or early modern human DNA from that far south because of preservation issues so we are trying this environmental DNA technique as well because that might also give us an indication of actually who's in the cave and who is responsible for producing particular um, stone tools and, and whether there may have been any overlap so so yes it's it's something that we're we're working on and hopefully in, in the next few years we'll have some some greater clarity yeah yeah and um also it, coming back to to funerary practices um i found it very interesting to read about the the evidence of compassion as you named it in in one of your uh, publications with the neanderthal individuals from shanidar cave with evidence of bone fractures and partially paralyzed individuals that probably had to be cared for by members of their social group, but, but also of, of violence with a puncture wound, uh, probably from a, from a projectile uh, of, of one rib from individual three. Um, am I understanding that, that correctly? Yes, no. So um, from the Neanderthals that were originally excavated by, by Ralph Selecki's team and, and analysed by um, Eric Trinkhouse and T. Dale Stewart, we do have a range of evidence. So as you say, Shanadar 3 has evidence of a puncture wound in the ribs. Um, Shanadar 1 very famously had suffered a, a head injury, which probably left him um, blind in one eye. He was partially deaf, partially paralysed on one side and probably had his, arm, his right arm amputated above the elbow. Mm. Um, so so, and yet survived a number of decades. So that does perhaps suggest what we might consider to be, yeah, compassion. Um, it's, again, we have to be a little bit careful with interpretation because our interpretations can be a bit clouded by our perception of ability and disability and whether that's correct to project those ideas onto the past. And there, there's... Um, a very interesting sort of developing um, analysis and, and approaches in this respect of sort of looking at the archaeology of sort of um, disability and, and ability in the past um, and the sort of the bioarchaeology of care approach as it's been, yeah. inter been termed. So, but I do think probably this does suggest a degree of, of compassion and it's interesting some of the suggestions that have been made, how that also links to whether we can sort of interpret 
the de deposition, you know, the intentional deposit of bodies, perhaps burials, if they were if they were that, as another sign of compassion to fellow individuals. But of course, it's it, it's tricky because people might bury or dispose of the dead in different ways for many reasons, and, and mm -hmm. some of that might be emotional, some of that might be symbolic, some of that might be entirely practical. So we do have to weigh up the evidence carefully, I think, before jumping to. To big conclusions about how they necessarily felt or or why uh, yeah, yeah. they did of things course. they do. Uh, and maybe speaking of that, um, I mostly work with with Neolithic graves, but I, I ask myself the the probably a bit philosophical <laughs> question: When did humans develop an awareness of death? So of course that's very difficult or even impossible to to answer. But but can you give us any insight with your experiences in in Paleolithic grave archaeology? When do we see the first um, quote unquote intentional or or proper burials? Yeah, I mean, it's, again, quite a contentious issue that's still widely debated, because as, as I just mentioned, there are many reasons why people or hominins might have done a particular thing with remains of other individuals. And that could be really sort of mundane as to get rid of getting rid of a kind of stinky body from the area you're living in, not to attract, you know, um, carnivores and things like that or, or it could be imbued with compassion we can see if we go back sort of signs of at least treatment of the body so we can look for example at um cima de los huesos where we've got a number of individuals deposited into sort of a, a, a cave from above down a shaft something similar with homo naledi um how we interpret that is it is again the tricky thing, whether that is symbolic in the way that we would mm -hmm. sort of treat our dead and how modern humans treat the dead. I mean, across societies, we see symbolic treatment of um, the dead. Whether we can infer that for these early examples, you know, similar to Potentially sort of 450,000 years ago. Again, we have to be a little careful. And the examples are you know, relatively few and far between. These are kind of exceptions um, from what we know at the moment. The whole issue of burial is an interesting one as well, because I think sometimes the whole idea of burial itself is sort of over, is given too much importance. Yeah. What is really important is the symbolic treatment of the dead. It, you know, in the West, we burial is one of the big ways that we... Um, lay our dead to rest and so to us it seems to be important but actually if you look cross-culturally in in modern human societies people treat the dead in all sorts of ways and you know we see sky burials and cremation and water mm -hmm. burials you know all sorts so so I think sometimes we give too much um, emphasis to burial per se and what we should actually be looking for is more kind of mortuary treatment so um Perhaps, for example, so coming back to the Shanadal Z example, it might be that that individual was buried, it, it, as in they were put into a cut grave and then covered over with soil. But it could actually be, and, you know, we're investigating this, they were put into this sort of excavated dip, you know, into a, into a shallow scoop and covered with something else like branches or skins or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so then technically that's not necessarily burial because you're not covering in soil. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. But does that matter? Because if that is some kind of intentional and symbolic treatment of the body, that's still something telling us something very important about how people thought, about cognition, about attitudes. So, so yeah, I, I kind of prefer to look more broadly at kind of um, what we might call mortuary treatment and, and evidence for symbolic treatment in the dead, of the dead in a variety of ways. Um, so yes, yeah, certainly we see signs of that, as I said, going back some time, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of years in, in the hominin lineage. I think we see it more consistently um, when we have Neanderthals and then anatomically modern humans as well. Um, but like I said, the whole issue of interpretation and then whether we, we see that in very kind of mundane terms or whether we can see or interpret that 
aspect of kind of symbolism and emotion is a much trickier question. Uh, yes, of course. And also with the variety of funerary practices, also in, in the Neolithic graves, I mean, you also have a, probably only a, a small fraction of, of all the population that was alive and, and, <laughs> and died then. Yes. Absolutely. And, and then you have to be a bit careful about sort of extrapolating those um, interpretations, as you know, to the whole society. But actually, maybe you've got a kind of a an unusual, exceptional, small part of that particular yes, society. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, yes, uh, thank you so much for having this this conversation, and I'm I'm looking forward to reading about your your future research about this very interesting topic. Thank you so much. No, thank you very much. It's great to chat. Okay, that was it for the first episode of 23 Minutes Archaeology with me, Noah. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe even learned something new. Again, you can go on Instagram and look at some pictures of these Neanderthal graves. And if you want to keep the podcast going, I would be very grateful for your support over on Patreon. With that, I want to thank Dr. Emma Pomeroy again for the very interesting conversation and my friends from the band Crying Vessel for the music. I hope you will tune in again for episode 2, where we will talk about what Herodotus had to say about Scythians in the Eurasian steppe.